I want to welcome you all to and thank you all for spending um, your lunchtime with us today on this um, somewhat tumultuous day um, in the world. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Hari Han. I'm the director of the SNF Agora Institute here at Johns Hopkins University. Um, as most of you know, I hope we're an academic center and a public forum dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as a cornerstone of global democracy. And we're really excited today to have the opportunity to talk with Rob Reich, Marin Sahami, and Jeremy Weinstein, who are the authors of a really great new book, um, System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. The book was published last November, and System Error looks at our reliance on technology and the power that big tech now wields. It uncovers the negative impacts of algor the algorithmic march toward optimization and charts a course for the re-democratization of technology. So it's super relevant to a lot of things that we think about here at SNF Agora. Um, a few housekeeping items before I introduce our speakers. Um, we're gonna start with a moderated discussion um, with Henry Farrell. And during that time, you can feel free to keep your camera on or off, whatever is comfortable for you, but just please make sure that your audio is muted so that we can hear the speakers. Um, and then we'll be taking audience questions um, afterwards and you can use the raise hand function in Zoom during the second half of the conversation. Um, Henry will invite participants to unmute and then pose their questions in turn. So you'll have an opportunity to talk with the authors then. And so now I'd like to start, um, start just by introducing today's guests. Um, first, we have Rob Reich, who is the director of Stanford University Center for Ethics and Society. He is co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society and associate director of Stanford's new Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Um, Rob, I don't think I realize that you direct so many things. I only do one and I find it very difficult. So I'm in great admiration for all of your work. Um, he is a leading thinker at the intersection of ethics and technology. And he's author of, um, in addition to this book of also of Just Giving, Why Philanthropy is Failing Democracy and How It Can Do Better. Maren Sahami is Associate Chair for Education in Stanford University's Computer Science Department. He holds the James and Eleanor Cheesebro Professorship in Engineering, and he helped redesign the undergraduate computer science curriculum. He's an inventor of email spam filtering technology, so we should all be grateful to him. And he, he was recruited to Google in its startup days. He now serves as an advisor to high tech startups. Jeremy Weinstein is leader of the Stanford Impact Labs. He works to partner research teams with leaders in the public, private, and social sectors to tackle important social problems. He's a prize winning author and teacher. He went to Washington with President Obama in 2009 and launched Obama's Open Government Partnership and was chief of staff and then deputy to Samantha Power, the US ambassador to the United Nations. Our moderator, Henry Farrell, is the SNF Agora Institute Professor of International Affairs at SAIS and the editor in chief of the Monkey Cage blog at, at the Washington Post. Henry is the co-author of several books, including The Uses and Abuses of Weaponized Interdependence and um, a book titled Of Privacy and Power, The Transatlantic Fight Over the Freedom and Security. Um, and so I'm really delighted to have all of you with us today. Um, Henry, I'll turn the conversation over to you now. Okay, well, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be the person who's uh, hosting this because this is a book that I think is a, uh, an extraordinarily important book. And uh, I, uh, I say that it's a book where there is a marketplace uh, full of books that claim to explain why technology is hurting democracy. Uh, there also are a uh, there's a smaller number of books which look at the uh, relationship with democracy and technology from a more pro technology perspective. But there are, as far as I can tell, next to no books that are written by people who understand both at once. People tend to have a shallow understanding of the democracy and a deep understanding of technology uh, or vice versa. They don't have the full understanding of the relationship between the two and why that relationship is changing. So I think that this is an extraordinarily important book. And if you haven't bought it, I uh, recommend, and I have not been uh, paid nor uh, sponsored by the Oscar Said, I recommend that you go out and buy it right away because it really, it really, I think, remakes the debate around democracy and technology in some ways that we are going to be thinking about for a number of years. And what it really gets, among other things, and here I would like to start and sort of jump into the discussion as quickly as possible because uh, there is a lot of there's a whole lot to talk about, much more than we can possibly talk about in the seminar. But I would like to start off by asking uh, maybe Jeremy to talk a little bit about democracy and about why so many people in Silicon Valley are more skeptical about democracy than one might expect them to be, where that skepticism comes from, and what kinds of implications that skepticism has for uh, American politics today. 
Well, thanks so much, Henry and Hari, for having us. It's just a pleasure to be with this group uh, and to be a part of uh, the kinds of discussions that Johns Hopkins and SNF Agora are prompting about the future of democracy at such a critical time. So as you could hear from the backgrounds, we're a pretty diverse group of writers in the sense that we've got a political philosopher, we've got a computer scientist, we've got a social scientist and policy guy, which is the role that I play on this team. And what's been most striking to me as someone interested in the role of our public institutions and the regulatory state in teaching at Stanford is just in our students, but also in the culture more broadly in Silicon Valley, an immediate orientation toward our public institutions to see them as an impediment to progress, to see them as a constraint on innovation to see them as an obstacle to the kind of transformation and human flourishing that people in this region, in this 10 miles around Silicon Valley uh, are so obsessed with generating and see technology as the key vehicle for doing so. It's gotten to the point where with undergraduates, I feel it's fundamentally important to challenge this anti-regulatory bent by reminding people just how central regulation is to every aspect of the lives that they live now, right? So for example, to ask our undergraduate students, did you get sick from the milk that you drank this morning? And why do you think you didn't? Or where is the clothing that you're wearing today produced? And do you have a skin rash as a result of wearing it? So there's a failure to recognize and appreciate that a set of guardrails underlie the functioning of our market economy. That's point number one. And then point number two is that when people critique regulation, what they are really critiquing is democracy. They're critiquing the role of our public institutions in helping us address social ends that we might wanna produce that are not naturally generated by the private market. And so one of the really important lenses that we've brought in our teaching and that we now bring in the book to thinking about the consequences of technology for society is to think about this through the lens of externalities. Because when we think about private behavior and its consequences for the water that we drink or the air that we breathe, people understand how that kind of social consequence is not priced into the decision-making of private companies. And that becomes a context in which the role of our public institutions in helping us to address those, those harms is something that is, in, is, in, is accepted broadly. But when it comes to technology's harms, this anti-regulatory bent, this sense that government policy and that our democratic institutions are too slow and moribund to play a role, what it essentially leans is towards a rejection of the role of those institutions. And what we've had for the last 25 years, which is a trust us, the, the technologists who are building technology, the CEOs who are leading tech companies, we'll get it right for everyone. And that may be held sway in a tech optimist moment, but in the tech pessimist moment that we're in now, it's no longer a convincing path forward. So one of the things, uh, Jeremy, that I've, uh, and I should say this also speaks to me personally because uh, you begin the book with a contrast between two uh, Stanford undergraduates, uh, Josh Browder, who is uh, very clearly of the move fast and break things school. He wants to advocate effectively the system for automating lawsuits uh, after figuring out how to automate the process of getting yourself out of a, a parking violation. And then Aaron Swartz, uh, who is a dear friend of mine, who is somebody who began in the valley, but then moved in a pretty different direction, looking to engage in politics and maybe engage in these questions of externalities and providing them sort of public benefits. So uh, it seems to me that there is, a, and this is one of the messages of the book, that there's a possible different vision of technology and its relationship to politics in there, in the work of people like Aaron, who like everybody else was a flawed human being, but I think a, a pretty extraordinary one. How do you build out possibly that second perspective, that more, uh, you know, that more constructive approach to uh, thinking about how technology can be used in the public good, rather than just assuming that uh, the uh, engineers and the CEOs know things better than everybody else. So we lift up these two stories in the opening of the book because, you know, 
young people are often looking for heroes. Society is often looking for heroes. And we find ourselves in a moment where the heroes and the names that are recognized are the startup founders whose technologies are transforming the world. But increasingly in the current moment, we've realized how complex those stories are and how the good that might come with access to social media and the agency and voice that people have on those platforms coexists with misinformation and disinformation, coexists with the challenges that we faced in the public health crisis as a result of what platforms have enabled. So we're at a moment where the complexity of the intersection of new technologies and the private market and the incentives that we'll get to that are driven by an engineer's mindset and venture capital have, have really made more complex and, and in some sense cast a negative light on that traditional story of the entrepreneur who sees the power of technology to make everyone better off and just disrupts the you know, staid and status quo ways that are holding us back. That's not, not a very compelling story right now. Um, and so we wanted to, to bring people's attention back to the Aaron Swartz vision, which really has its roots in the origins of Silicon Valley, the role of technology as a force for empowerment, for agency, for liberation. Um, but Aaron in his own work was also very concerned with and attentive to how power is exercised uh, and who has access to power, who has a seat at the table, who is making choices. So when I think about the work that we're trying to do with the book and the work that we're trying to do in our own teaching, it's to cast aside a number of myths. You know, myth number one is that technology is neutral, right? That the people who build technology, they don't have any values in particular that they're trying to advance. That's really the work of whoever decides to use the technology. And I think we dispense with that myth. And the second myth is that um, unless you are a technologist, you have no role to play in our technological future. That to be engaged in thinking about the relationship between technology and society and democracy, you have to understand artificial intelligence and how it all works. You have to understand uh, you know, what end-to-end -end encrypted technology means and what the tweaks might be on that model to address you know, potential harms. And I think you know, we reject both of these ideas and what we make central to the book and what we make central to our teaching is that in every single way as new technologies are designed, they surface values that are in tension with one another. And those who are designing those technologies or financing the technologies or overseeing the companies are every day making choices that affect all of us. And some of those choices we may be comfortable with, but some of them we might not be comfortable with. And when critical values that we care about, say fairness, in decision-making that's critical to our democratic institutions, but maybe not as central to those who are designing an algorithmic decision-making tool to optimize for some efficient outcome. When these things are in tension with one another, we have to think together about what is the engineer's role in identifying those value trade-offs? What is the company's role in seeking input from outside of its engineering team? Not just figuring out what the baseline law allows, but what's actually at stake in terms of the, the potential consequences that might be generated? And what are the appropriate moments at which all of us need to have a voice through our democratic institutions in refereeing these value trade-offs? And in order to do that, we've got to demystify technology. We've got to do away with the myth that technology is value neutral. We need engineers and financiers to understand just how much unaccountable power they're exercising. And then we need to ready our democratic institutions with citizen engagement to exercise voice and influence on these decisions. So one question I have, you, you spoke a little bit uh, about how it is that we are now, we've moved from an age of technological optimism pretty rapidly into one of technological pessimism. And my sense as an outsider to these uh, discussions is that there is a lot of defensiveness in Silicon Valley at the moment. If you look, for example, at Andreessen Horowitz uh, looking to subsidize the publication of a more optimistic slant on what technology can do. If you look perhaps at the uh, notion of progress studies, which Tyler Cowen and other people have been pushing, Patrick Collison, I think, is involved in some ways in that as well. And you could view this as being a purely defensive reaction, and maybe that is all that it is. 
But I'm wondering if there are any, if there's any critical self-reflection that is happening among Silicon Valley thinkers, uh, spurred by the kinds of arguments that you and others have been making about how it is that we need to uh, think not just about this kind of this blithe optimistic, um, sort of if we break stuff, better things will happen perspective, and moving towards one that is um, sort of more uh, reflective of the uh, kinds of uh, 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 value decisions that you uh, highlighted as being crucial to the uh, process of actually understanding what technology does in society. So I think some of the, uh, go ahead, Rob. Go ahead, Jeremy, you go first. I, I think some of the core ideas that animate, you know, the Andreessen Horowitz sort of focus on, on sort of breakthroughs and, and progress studies that we're seeing out of Collison are sort of well, really well taken. We wanna understand where revolutions come from. And by that, I don't mean political revolutions, but I mean revolutions that transform the way we live, our life expectancy, our economic opportunity. These are things that, that all of us aspire to. What's changed, I think, and, and we see it not just in the broader discussion, but also among technologists themselves, is the naive view that the design of technology itself generates that breakthrough in an almost deterministic way. Um, and that I think is no longer widely held. Um, you know, we teach an evening course for professional technologists alongside uh, the work that we do at Stanford. And what's very clear to us, very different than when we started this work three or four years ago is that people are walking around with a profound sense of the consequences, some unexpected, many harmful of the technologies that they built. So having gone into these companies with the view that the mission statements of the company, which were take this extraordinary power that you have, these skills and these tools, and you'll make everyone in the world better off. Like people don't believe that anymore. Um, you can't walk around, you know, seeing what's happening in society and actually hold that close. So people are grappling with the complexity of effects in the world and their complicity in the outcomes uh, that are the result of their own sort of technological capability and power deployed. And the only thing I'd end with on this is just to say, I wish the same enthusiasm for working around our existing institutions, for disrupting and breaking things was being brought to transforming our existing institutions. Because when I hear people in Silicon Valley criticize our democracy and say, democracy doesn't have the expertise that it needs, you know, to, to help us navigate our technological future. It's too slow, it's too uninformed. I ask the question, well, how do you think it got that way, right? And whose fault do you think that is? If you don't pay taxes, if you won't lend your own expertise to our political institutions, right? If, if you want, you know, if, if you look back at the history of the deregulation moment and the breaking down and stripping of our public institutions of all their scientific expertise, you recognize that a democracy that's incapable of governing technology was our choice. It's not something that's fixed in the, the idea of government or the idea of democracy. It's something that we've created. And I wish the folks that were so enthusiastic about change and transformation were equally invested in re-energizing our political institutions and our democracy. Can I just hop in there to say uh, that, you know, at the extreme part of what, um, you know, we believe sits behind that, that lack of interest in um, re-energizing and transforming democratic institutions themselves amongst technologists is that, um, you know, I'll give you a sort of cartoon version of, of the explanation. It's a pretty well known um, um, observation at this point that the founders tend to have a libertarian mindset. So they're, insofar as they have political commitments, it's to some type of min minimal role of the state. And you could, you know, go further here that um, uh, there's a kind of Randian veneration of the heroic role of the solitary founder and the entrepreneur that is the chief engine of progress in society and in certain respects that sits loosely behind the entire venture capital mode of operation at the moment in which you you know purposefully seek out especially young creative um, founders and leaders you know backstop them with a bunch of money and put your put your your sort of voice behind a couple of individuals who are the, the heroes of, of, of progress when you combine that libertarian mindset with the veneration of young founders, a kind who you know 
chosen almost partly because they have no lived experience in, in as adults in society. They they don't yet um, 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 you know glom on to history itself. It's almost like anyone who understands history is shackled um, in their own expansive imaginations and visions. So better to fund the 21 year olds that just come out of college than the 30 or 40 year olds. So when you couple that mindset um, uh, with the rise of extraordinarily large companies um, taking over and dominating the, the marketplace, uh, you get not just a kind of disinterest in democratic institutions, but a kind of principled aversion to them. And, you know, we tell a story in the book that happened uh, um, with me where I got invited to a dinner amongst some, you know, um, uh, venture capitalists and, and, and technologists, names you would recognize. And the topic of discussion at the dinner was, was what would it mean to try to find a plot of land on earth that would be devoted to the maximal progress of science and technology. Uh, with this, you know, how would this work? Would it be good? Would it be bad? The conversation immediately launched around the table about how this could go. Various people said they'd already tried to kind of spec it out. Um, they were making, you know, sort of active progress on seeing how this would go. And eventually I raised my hand and said, like, you know, as the political theorist and philosopher here, I'm, I, no one's spoken yet about the governance arrangement. Is this a democracy we're talking about or, or not? And there was you know, an immediate reaction that democracy could not be the way this place was governed because democracy holds back progress. And you want an enlightened technocracy as the governance model for the maximal progress of science and technology. So I mean, at the end of the day, like at the extreme, a certain type of libertarian technologist basically does not have any principled commitment to democracy itself because it limits um, the maximal progress of science and technology. And you know, so you get things like Washington DC is just broken. It's a suboptimal institutional arrangement. And we here are the optimizers. Um, libertarianism is the political view. Um, the technical approach is optimization of whatever the social output is and democracy is suboptimal. The, the uh, two things very quickly on that, and sort of one other uh, extraordinary anecdote in the book is the one about Josh Cohen talking to a uh, president of Stanford University and being told more or less, why the hell would we send our uh, students or our graduates into uh, government service, uh, suggesting that this was a time suck. And uh, also just to name check another great book, which is Margaret O'Mara's The Code, which really talks about the ways in which uh, government was embedded in the process of creating Silicon Valley in the first place in ways that I think that a lot of today's entrepreneurs uh, you know, have, have forgotten and have uh, written out of the historical memory. The other, another, uh, I think, extraordinary part of the book and something that I think really should be uh, required reading for everybody in Washington, D.C., is the uh, discussion of optimization. And uh, here, you know, this is something that uh, I say as somebody who's tried to think about writing about this for a broader audience, uh, because it is incredibly important and incredibly poorly understood outside of the engineering community. But optimization, this, this term carries a lot of, it, it, it has extraordinary power. It also carries a lot of baggage. And I was wondering, Meran, if you could talk a little bit about uh, how optimization works in Silicon Valley and what kinds of consequences it has had. Sure. Well, thanks for having us. The, the general notion of optimization, certainly part of the mindset of engineering in general, and you see it specifically in computer science occur over and over. You know, as computer scientists, we measure the efficacy of what we do through optimization. We look at how quickly our algorithms run, for example, how much memory they use. It's something that's embedded into students very early on is what you want to op what you want to do is you want to optimize with respect to a bunch of different factors. But one of the things that, you know, as Jeremy and Rob both alluded to is when you think about value trade-offs, something that's oftentimes misunderstood is when you choose to optimize something, the thing you, you are choosing to optimize has values encoded in it. And so when we think about in machine learning, for example, which is kind of the hot topic in computer science these days, we might choose to optimize something like how accurate a particular algorithm is and think, well, why wouldn't you want the most accurate algorithm possible? 
And what you need to think about is the optimization itself, the process of doing optimization really isn't a value itself. The value says, what's the objective function you're trying to optimize? If I'm trying to get the most accurate result, which sounds just fine in practice and is what actually what people do most of the time, what you need to understand is that encodes a value of basically favoring the majority because you do the well, most well on accuracy overall by doing very well on the majority population. And so if you have small minority populations, you can do poorly on those populations, but overall you still seem to be doing well. So unless you think about some sort of countervailing force, like you care about justice or you care about equity, and that's somehow built into your optimization, and you're thinking about the values of what that objective function is, just choosing to optimize the things that many people choose to optimize now and accept as the de facto good is actually promoting particular values that are a problem. And so if you now take this mindset of optimization and realize that many of the people who are venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are former engineers. So this goes back historically. If you go back to some of the firms like Kleiner Perkins, for example, um, or you know, consider John Doerr, who is their chairman now, his training is as an electrical engineer. Mark Andreessen, who you alluded to, was actually originally an engineer who worked on the Mosaic browser, right, helped bring us the World Wide Web, but is now best known as a venture capitalist at the firm that carries his name, Andreessen Horowitz. And so they carry with them this optimization mindset and bring it to the founding of companies. It's sort of a winner-take-all mentality. And that's actually what exists in a lot of markets that you see online, for example. They're, in fact, two-sided markets that favor monopolistic tendencies. And so being the number one player there becomes critical, and they gain a disproportionate advantage in terms of market capitalization and being able to draw talent. One of the examples we use in the book, and I can ask you here, is you know, for people who do online shopping or, or engage in online auctions, what's the number one online auction? Anyone want to venture a guess or put it in the chat? eBay. eBay. You'd be exactly right. What's number two? No one usually has any idea. And the reason is because there's such a strong monopolistic tendency there that the firm that has optimized in some sense and come out ahead gets disproportionate attention and disproportionate market share. And then, you know, two, three, four, et cetera, unless they already have some substantial other reason why they might be competitors, basically pick up the crumbs. And so what Silicon Valley wants to do is it wants to use this notion of optimization to be able to dominate. And a very clear example of this, if you consider something like advertising technology, how well you do your optimization has profound impact on how well you do in the marketplace. And a simple example of that is if you look at the difference between Yahoo and Google. In its early days, Yahoo dominated the market, but really when it came time to understand how do people really make money online and advertising became the dominant model, Yahoo did a much poorer job in terms of and being able to optimize its advertising technology as opposed to Google. What was the market outcome? Yahoo gets acquired for four and a half billion dollars. Google's market cap today is 1.7 trillion. So it's orders of magnitude difference between the winners and the losers. And when you think about what are the values that are actually being optimized there, we see multiple themes coming up in technology. It's not just about accuracy of machine learning algorithms. It's not just about market dominance. But if you consider a particular technology like encryption, most people would say, well, encryption is great for people who want to protect their privacy. And that's true. It puts a very heavy thumb on the scale of privacy. Well, what about rival values? What about something like national security when terrorists are using an end-to-end -end encrypted platform like Signal to be able to organize? Or if you consider a particular case study of the Apple iPhone being encrypted and the San Bernardino shooter having one and the government wanting to unlock the iPhone to see if there was evidence there of further terrorist activity and Apple saying, no, we're not going to unlock it because we, wanna, we favor encryption and we favor privacy. So these are value trade-offs that are playing out in real time that are enabled by technology. And so sometimes the, the technologist term of saying technology is neutral, um, you see how that really belies the fact that no, in fact, technology is extremely value laden, just making the claim that it's neutral is ignoring the values that are involved. So one question which I'm interested in here, and this is something that uh, 
Bruce Schneier, who is a uh, information security th person who thinks about this from a, an adversarial perspective. If you think about the ways that uh, natural language processing uh, technologies such as GPT-3, which can generate huge amounts of apparently human generated textual uh, output and sort of uh, from a, a corpus of data. If you think about how those could be uh, used, um, for example, to uh, completely flood the commenting systems that uh, the federal government relies upon in order to solicit comments from relevant actors, uh, how the hell do you, you know, how the hell do you secure democracy from these uh, new technologies? Are there ways um, sort of to uh, try and observe uh, push back? What kind of world are we in? Uh, you know, so where, as you say, these um, sort of this, this focus on a particular set of uh, algorithmic techniques can have um, sort of much broader political consequences, which uh, sometimes are thought of by their designers and sometimes only uh, occur to them after they've been broken. Well, that's a great question. And there's, I think, two important facets of that. One is the people building the technology and one is the technology itself. So at one level, what people have done, you know, the technological solution is to use technology to fight technology. So for example, when you want to consider a content moderation system that's looking at the posts that are on there, if you understand something about the technology, you could build a filtering system that's trying to filter out those posts or trying to find what is fakes. And one of the other technologies we have to deal with now, GPT-3 is an example of this from the textual side, but is also deep fakes from the image side. Yeah. And so there has been a pretty substantial body of research at this point of how do we try to detect these things? Are there artifacts and what's being generated by these algorithms that we can then detect and be able to filter out? That's one approach to go, but that just basically turns into an arms race. That's a problem that's never gonna be solved and is never gonna end. The flip side is to understand, well, the people producing the, these technologies, what kind of guardrails are they putting in place? What kind of value trade-offs are they considering when they're building the technology? And so there's actually an interesting point in the history of GPT-3 that you mentioned in terms of language generation, um, when they were actually building these models and they, they were building them as essentially, you know, technological curiosities. Could we do better at this notion of language generation? When they built the model for GPT-2, the precursor for GPT-3, they refused to release it because they actually realized yeah. some of the impacts that, that it could be wrought in the world. Well, what happens is, you know, things change, values change, and you get this uh, exclusive agreement between Microsoft and OpenAI to license GPT-3. There's real commercial value there. The value of that deal is a billion dollars. So we're not talking small amounts of money here. And there was this push to be able to commercialize some aspects of GPT-3 and make it available for people to, to try out. So part of the question is, well, where were the guardrails in that process? And why is that question a question that OpenAI gets to answer for itself? rather than realizing that there's actually implications for things like national security and that there should be a broader set of constituents actually involved in that decision-making process. Can I just hop in there, Henry, to add something on GPT-3? Because in certain respects, our book ends with a, a brief reflection on GPT-3. And, and we've been also teaching it uh, in our class um, just, just recently. And in many respects, this is the kind of frontier environment where um, a combination of public attention, policy attention, and importantly, the professional norms of the technologists and, and venture capital community, um, we think need to be brought, brought to bear on this very powerful and um, important development, these language models, which are now all the rage out here. And so you referenced the, the Schneier article, and I just wanna say a couple of things about how GPT-3 represents um, um, in certain respects, all of the things we've been talking about so far. So there's the idea that was often in the heads of technologists that are a sort of naive um, expectation of how human nature um, would be brought to bear in using the, the tools or technologies that are developed. You know, Zuckerberg famously said a bunch of years ago that he, you know, he, he couldn't imagine on the one hand that billions of people would actually use the product he developed, but that they would also use it in ways that brought out the worst of human nature. Uh, and um, the adversarial use cases of language models um, present themselves so readily and obviously, you know, the kind of low cost machine bot driven um, injection of misinformation into the informational um, ecosystem. And this, this, is, this is, you know, adversarial misinformation, disinformation campaigns on steroids at low cost. It's really, 
um, extraordinarily worrisome for, in that respect. But it also presents GPT-3 kind of fam more familiar questions about fairness and, and, and equity. Um, um, so for example, um, studies have been done on these language models for the reasons of optimization that Marin was describing before. These models ingest huge oceans of text. They try to make predictions about um, um, what kinds of sentences or words should follow from a human given prompt once the model has been trained. And there have been studies that have been done that show a kind of, um, it's kind of a remarkable stubborn anti-Muslim bias. So if you give GPT-3 a prompt that says something like, two Muslims walk into a mosque and begin to pray, um, the output from GPT-3 will you know, often include things like, um, and they unload their backpacks with the explosives um, in order to do X, Y, and Z. If you give it a prompt that says, two peaceful Muslims walk into a mosque and kneel down and begin to say their prayers, even the prompts of peaceful and um, um, still yields biased outcomes or you know, toxic outcomes. So these issues of fairness are built in right away. Now, um, the final thing just to say about this is from our perspective, the, um, the regulatory efforts to keep up with these frontier technologies are always going to be different, uh, difficult. The, the, you know, the, we, we call one of the early parts of, the, of, of the, the book, the race between disruption and democracy. We, we should never expect that regulators in DC are fully abreast of every of the latest technical developments, which means in our view that we have to rapidly advance the professional norms and ethics of the technologists themselves. And you know, we make brief allusion to the kind of widespread institutional professional norms in the realm of biomedical research and R&D and development in you know, medicine as compared to the rather developmentally immature set of professional norms within AI science and AI research within companies, as well as in the academy. And uh, we want rapidly to advance the kind of professional norms, expectations, the codes of conduct of what responsible practice of AI science looks like, because at the moment, it's basically an anything goes environment. And there's no such thing as doing something with AI or ML that could ostracize you from the respectable practice of AI or ML. Um, if you can do it and get away with it, basically you're good to go. So we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you one final question, Rob, which is a, a big one, which is, you know, the book, I, there's a ton of stuff that I can't, uh, we don't have time to talk about. Perhaps it'll come up in questions and answers, very specific recommendations you make for the uh, technology advice process and so on. But there's also the sense of democracy as being a good thing in all of its messiness, in all of its frustrations, in all of the difficulties and uh, ways in which um, sort of it, it, it bungs thing, things up. Nonetheless, it reflects the plurality of values in a way that um, sort of these and sort of optimization decisions, which are taken by people more or less in reference to their commercial interests are you know, across a relatively narrow ideological spectrum, that, that can, all of that information effectively gets and sort of drowned out of the process. So you refer uh, to Karl Popper uh, in two ways. Uh, Popper, of course, was a famously an advocate of the open society. Uh, and you suggest on the one hand that democracy has the advantage of, uh, of avoiding some of the worst possible outcomes. On the other hand, you also talk about uh, very briefly about what Popper called piecemeal social engineering, as opposed to the big scale kinds of um, sort of uh, dramatic transformations that he was worried about, and which also uh, came from optimization in a sense. If you look at the Soviet Union, you know, sort of the Soviet Union is all about uh, Kantorovich and um, sort of optimizing clans. So, but how do you get to a world of piecemeal social engineering? How could that fit better with democracy? And how can we figure out a positive agenda for making democracy better, building upon some of what has already been discussed? Yeah, good. So, um, right, we, 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 we invoke Popper for exactly the reasons you described, Henry, the, the open society, the aspect in which the, the reasons we have to value um, um, democracy itself, and Popper's phrase, piecemeal social engineering goes along with this idea that we, we, we um, mentioned in the book that we should think of democratic institutions or the virtue of democracy, not because it optimizes some social product or social output, but rather because it's the fairest process that we have yet invented for social arrangements 
um, to put guardrails in place to, to avoid the worst possible outcomes. We talk, for example, about the famous finding from Amartya Sen that points to the fact that um, famines are not natural disasters that befall human beings, but rather can be prevented through democratic um, institutions. Um, you know, for, for people who haven't, haven't read this, the nub of this argument is something like, democracies are a social arrangement to produce responsiveness at some basic level to citizen preferences. And when people are starving to death, they will actively um, um, communicate their preference not to starve and democratic institutions will respond, whereas non-democratic ones are somewhat immunized from responsiveness to preferences. Um, in this respect, we, we shouldn't hope for democracy um, to be the, um, you know, the site of master arrangements that allow us to optimize some set of outputs. Uh, this is also for what it's worth where the optimization mindset and democratic governance um, come into tension. Um, if we think about democracy as the best available uh, social technology for treating people as free and equals and for avoiding the worst outcomes, we'll have a, a, at least a minimal sense about how to think about piecemeal social engineering because we won't expect our social planners to have all of the optimal answers. There will be a decentralized approach where value pluralism is a background expectation. Uh, and, and no one is ever invited to be the social optimizer. That's a, in fact, what you want to avoid. Okay, well, thank you so much. And apologies, there's some background noise here, but I'd like to jump right into the questions and answers. And I see that Moshe Vardy has his uh, hand up uh, if you would like to speak. Uh, so unmute yourself and uh, then uh, speak. And obviously, questions should be as to the point as possible. Thank you for this very fascinating conversation. I'd like to follow up on, on one word that was mentioned, and I don't remember, maybe Henry, uh, Jeremy mentioned this word, complicity, which is we are still societally looking at this uh, Silicon Valley uh, personalities as heroes. Maybe Mark Zuckerberg is now more viewed as a villain rather than a hero. But Eric Schmidt is now a respectable senior elder statement, so to speak. With all due respect, Google invented surveillance capitalism and Facebook just followed in its footstep. So if we want to change how people behave, we have to start, there are certain ways that the children are taught how to behave is because the parents tell them, no, no, no. You can drop, you cannot drop uh, this piece of dirt here. This is not acceptable. And when are we going to start looking at these people and societally said, no, I mean, somebody mentioned ostracism. I don't know, this is maybe a bit too strong, but, but at least we need to take away the hero cape away from them. And, and at the end of the day, there is one value in Silicon Valley. You optimize for profits. All the other things are nice stories. But these people have basically optimized for profit and we are paying the price. Okay, so, so, go ahead, Henry. No, I was just saying, go ahead. Yeah. So thank you, Moshe, for your, your, your comment on this issue. And I think one thing I wanna make abundantly clear, you know, from our perspective, and, and we cover this in the book, is that we think about the ethical responsibility um, that, that technologists have at really three different levels. There's the level of personal ethics, there's the level of professional ethics, and there's the level of political or social ethics. And at the level of personal ethics, um, we don't think that's the most interesting part of the conversation because we use the example of say Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. The activity that Elizabeth Holmes undertook the, the accusations and now convicted of defrauding investors, lying in some sense, cheating and stealing, misrepresenting what her technology was doing. It's abundantly clear to anyone that we teach or anyone we, that we engage that such behavior is unacceptable. What's far more interesting, I think, are the value tensions that Maron, for example, described around the creation of WhatsApp and Signal or people who are working to automate work, but not thinking about the consequences for those who might be left behind. These environments where new technologies are being generated that have extraordinary positive benefits, 
but also generate a set of social harms. And these are really in the realm of professional ethics and political and social ethics, where you don't point to someone and say they're a bad person and they had the wrong intentions, but in fact, they exist in a system that is a regulatory oasis around technology, the capitalist orientation of companies, a profit motive, as you said, that drives their decision-making, and where there's no right answer to how to weigh those value trade-offs. But as a society, we've left it to technologists to weigh those value trade-offs on our behalf. And so for us, it's not really about the Zuckerberg or about the Sheryl Sandberg or about any of these CEOs. It's about a system error, a system error that has enabled the refereeing of these value trade-offs to be left in the hand of technologists. And I think we can do a lot better than that. And that's that requires change with respect to professional ethics and change with respect to political and social ethics, which is really what democratic institutions are designed to provide. Thank you. Steve, tell us. Hi, Rob. Uh, a really interesting presentation. Um, I guess my comment may be predictable um, from the fact that I wrote this book, The Captured Economy. Um, and part of what comes across in your talk is I wonder whether there's a bit of a, um, the way you discuss democracy is a little abstract, right? Um, and so you're, in some places, it feels like you're comparing an idealized version of democracy to a realistic view of technology. And that's not, methodologically, that's got something to, to answer for, I guess, right? That is, just looking at, <clears throat> at Silicon Valley, right? Uh, when I look at the housing problem in Silicon Valley, it feels like a profound failure of at least one way of institutionalizing democracy, right? Um, it's a result in a way of, of excessive, you know, at least excessive democracy organized in a particular way, right? Um, and a, uh, a, a fetishization of participation, again, at least when democracy is institutionalized in a particular way and when decisions are put at a particular level. And so part of me wonders whether the problem with the technologists you're discussing is not that they don't sense that there's something wrong with the democratic decision making, right? But that their answer is not some other way of designing institutions, right? But that the, the substitution of some kind of technocratic form of institutions, as opposed to a, what I would talk about as a kind of anti-rent seeking form of democracy. So can you talk about, this, especially that point about, you know, am I pointing to an actual vulnerability in your argument that you may be idealizing democracy in this comparison? And is the real answer for <clears throat> technologists to learn to be better political scientists, right, in a sense, right, um, not to step back from critiquing democracy, right, given that there's lots of, there's lots of things to be answerable for in the democracy we actually have, and that they should be engaged in that conversation, and in fact engaged in helping up build up institutions, including institutions outside of government, to make um, government less yep. democracy less susceptible to those yep. forms of capture. Great. So, I mean, point number one is that it, it, even if I accept, and I think you, you're on to something um, um, worth discussing, that there's a, a realistic assessment of technology and technologists and an idealized um, description of democracy. Um, um, nevertheless, at the extreme, as I described earlier, I think there are some technologists who have a principled um, um, kind of rejection of, uh, of democracy itself. They'd prefer if it could be put in place an enlightened technocracy um, as the actual arrangement for, for social, social and political governance. But leaving that extreme aside, um, I think there are uh, two ways I want to respond to that and see if Maron or Jeremy want to add something as well. Number one is just to avert to where Jeremy began about why we started the book with Aaron Swartz and, and Joshua Browder. Um, so rather than saying, um, here are all the ways in which our public institutions um, uh, are 
dysfunctional and predictably dysfunctional in the future, uh, we can try to invite young technologists to imagine themselves as deploying their technical talents on behalf of a civic agenda, the Aaron Swartz agenda, the Audrey Tang agenda, the ways in which um, technological infusion into public institutions can serve democratic ideals rather than viewing public institutions and democracy as somehow a break on the maximal progress of science. That's part of the effort of you know, why we think being located in Silicon Valley and the kind of teaching we're doing hopefully is um, reaching an audience of trying to remind people of those early, early kind of tech heroes who did imagine that technology was a civic force, not just a commercial force to change the world. Uh, all right, secondly, you know, the book does have some um, realistic assessment of democratic institutions. Uh, we talk about things like the Office of Technological Assessment in, in the, created in the 70s and 80s, and a variety of other kinds of um, on the ground approaches, um, the reinvigoration of a sort of antitrust, neo Brandeisian approach to an, antitrust approaches that um, don't require an idealized view of what democracy is capable of, but you know, a, a, a kind of insidery assessment. You know, one criticism I think we've gotten of the book is that after pointing out some of these large picture problems, the OTA is the, is the, is the answer. And, and at some level, uh, we do believe that the answer in, in reinvigorating democratic institutions is something as seemingly unsexy and technical as creating public agencies that have the necessary know-how to inform the actually existing operation of democratic institutions and elected politicians. Um, let me just see if, if Jeremy and Maron want to add anything to that. I think, you know, maybe the comment I'd make at a, at a higher level is that, you know, often people hear this argument, which is about the optimization mindset coming together with the sort of scaling incentives that exist in venture capital and the network effects of these technologies and then government's failure. And they say, capitalism needs to be fixed and democracy needs to be fixed or else we can't make any progress. And I think while we believe that there are really important conversations to be had about the future of democracy and the future of capitalism, um, for many of the reasons that you cited. Um, we also believe that the establishment of guardrails around markets is a part of normal politics. And the failure to establish those guardrails has been the result of a kind of tacit agreement between Democrats and Republicans since 1995 uh, to put their thumb on the scale for the growth of technology and the unconstrained growth of technology alongside a naive view about technology's beneficial effects and a blindness to its potential harms. And so, yes, I'm enthusiastic about thinking about new models of capitalism that take seriously stakeholders and not just shareholders. And I'm enthusiastic about thinking about how we reimagine and reshape democracy to deal with concentrated interests and their ability to exercise power especially as it relates to money and politics. But I am not of the view that we can't make progress on building more substantial guardrails around the tech sector in the absence of fixing capitalism and fixing democracy. That I just feel is the responsibility of our public office holders, of an engaged citizenry, and increasingly of public institutions that we're already seeing in the Biden administration recognize that a substantial pivot is needed from the last 25 years of politics around tech. The only thing I'd add to that briefly is that, you know, if you think about the fact that in many processes, friction is what slows them down. What we've gotten to is a place that as optimizations applied more and you think about within the rules of a system, doing that optimization, for example, for things like profit maximization, what it means is the system has to be much more sensitive now to that kind of reaction to what people will do in the system as opposed to counting on the fact that previously there was friction that would have slowed people down. That friction is just going away. And so we actually need to have regulatory processes that are agile in the face of it. I'm optimistic too that that's possible to do, but doing that actually requires a recognition of the, in some sense, the adversary you're facing, what 
someone will try to do with re in response to regulation, and it needs to be written with, with an understanding of the fact that people will optimize in the face of it and try to find all the corner cases they can. Okay, Philip Honenberger would like to ask a question. Hey, thanks so much. I, um, I really appreciate this conversation. I think it seems clear that you're doing a kind of deep diagnostic on where a lot of the problems that are already part of a public discussion are coming from, and that's very important. Um, one thing that kind of appears in, in this set of issues is sort of intractable value conflicts, like between you know, privacy and security or state sovereignty. Um, I think in a way you've sort of focused on like techno technical progress versus ethics as a, as a trade-off that is in the mind of Silicon Valley um, affiliates. And I, I wanna invite you to say a little bit about in your view, what do you think is sort of like the low hanging fruit for resolving some of the, like, are there any of those conflicts that you sort of, we sort of already know what are the necessary policies for addressing them? And which are some ones that you think, gosh, nobody knows how to deal with this. I mean, it's it, the technology itself, some benefits that are coming from the technology introduce problems that we, we don't know how to address, but we don't wanna give up the benefits of the technology. So just sort of bend things a little bit, if you don't mind. Because I, I know, again, your project is deeper. You want to do things like teach technologists how to be better ethicists and political scientists. But in the short term, what, where are the problems we, we already know how to fix and we need to just sort of move in a policy direction to fixing them? And what are the ones that are harder to fix? I'll give three pieces of low-hanging fruit really quickly. Um, number one, uh, as we move into a world of algorithmic decision-making that replaces human decision-making in critical public institutions, but also in the private sector, people's expectations about fairness and equal treatment and explainability and auditability and understanding need to be instantiated in rules and expectations about the use of these tools and systems. We already see the beginnings of legislative momentum around this. We see the development of technological tools to make it possible, but it's totally in its infancy. And the use of these tools in critical decisions about access to capital, about access to jobs, about access to educational institutions is happening all the time and everywhere. That's a solvable problem. On privacy, even though you talk about this kind of existential sort of threat or challenge between privacy and national security, at a much more micro level, we know that our structure of notice and consent and transparency and choice is fundamentally asymmetric in terms of the power that exists in the hands of technology companies that are using people's data. And so the libertarian instinct to leave it to individuals to self-manage their own privacy in the face of a total lack of understanding about how their data is gonna be used in the face of a hundred page, you know, user agreements that they have to sign, which they can't even understand. Uh, and in the, in the face of needing to adopt their privacy settings for every single application that they use, like we could be much better at even enabling privacy self-management so that we could address some of the core issues at the heart of the privacy paradox, which is the disconnect between people's preferences and their behavior. And then final piece of low hanging fruit, just on the consequences of automation. We know that automation is gonna disproportionately harm people at the lower end of the income distribution, people who don't have skills that are highly markable, people who haven't finished uh, act, you know, higher education. We also know what kinds of things that you can do to ensure people against those shocks and to enable them to develop new skills, but we're simply not making those investments. So it doesn't require some dramatic reinvention of technology, it requires a surfacing of that problem and a collective desire to do something about it. And maybe to comment on the really difficult problems, I think one of the most difficult problems we're going to be dealing with for a long time is content moderation and free speech. Um, and you can see it play out on social networking platforms now, but that's one of the places where 
there is no technological solution there. It's not clear whether or not there's even a social solution because different people will agree about what hate speech is or what harassment is. But it's the place where right now it seems like we have a much wilder frontier and the decisions are being made within the tech companies themselves. And for something as important as understanding who has free speech and how it impacts people, that seems like something that shouldn't be left in the hands of a few content moderators at a tech company. And given the multiple disciplines uh, um, represented here in the in the Zoom room, uh, I'll just offer two additional thoughts um, uh, for Philip and, and others who have asked about this. So at some deep philosophical level, for me at least, I'm, I'm not sure Maron and Jeremy would sign on to this. The initial observation, Philip, about um, these value tensions and perhaps irreconcilable value tensions points at some level to me to forcing us to confront the idea of the incommensurability of rival values. So that the optimization approach of the technologist in that respect, if in fact, the kinds of values that are encoded into technological pro products can't actually be you know, resolved on a single metric. Uh, optimization is bound in that respect to fail because of this deep incommensurability. And that leaves the kind of idiosyncratic preferences the technologists as the agents in society determining what it is that gets optimized for. And even if our democratic institutions aren't up to the task to, as you put it, resolving the trade-offs themselves, the democratic approach or the broader approach lifting the decision-making outside of a company has the virtue of greater legitimacy. And in a democracy, we can continually revisit how it is that we approach these different value trade-offs and tensions, rather than thinking as the optimizers might be likely to think, can't we get the answer right in our technology and then just move on to the next problem? Um, that's in certain respects what we wanna resist in, in the book and in the approach. We, we are in the domain of better and worse answers to value tensions and trade-offs, not to finding the final correct resolution. Um, in, in other words, to put a you know intellectual label to this, for me, I, I'm a Berlinian value pluralist. The, the tragic choices we have to make in life are between rival good values and the moral residue that we can't always get a perfect whole. Um, that's what we face in our technological future. And democracy has the enormous advantage in an idealized sense of uh, being legitimate, not to getting the right answer to a question. Theodore Lieval has a question, if I'm pronouncing his surname correctly, and if not, apologies. Uh, it's, it's okay. Most people get it wrong on the first try. Um, so thanks so much for your time. Uh, this is really directed at Rob, but happy to hear from any of you on this. So Rob, you talked about deploying technology and having technologists sort of imbued with a civic agenda. Um, I think that's important, but I'm also wondering, do you also think um, there needs to be some sort of overlay of curriculum of like just rethinking capital. Like, I feel like that's the core of it. Like having a civic agenda is like the the one end of it. And then rethinking how um, technologists view capital and those processes that, um, you know, co-locate with it. Um, so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, well, Again, like speaking just in, in slight exaggeration here, my experience on the campus for the past 20 years, Silicon Valley resident for the past 25 years, is, is that um, there's a kind of uh, um, studious indifference to, um, or worse, like principled rejection of the need to have a view about history or a view about political economy amongst technologists. Um, you get this extraordinary superpower that you um, comes along with the technical skills of being a, a coder, a programmer, and the 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 Kool Aid, um, which is indeed like it, 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 worth drinking in certain respects, is the idea that unlike the generation of people who graduated from college with my you know my cohort 25 years ago, where you know half the graduating class went off to management consulting or Wall Street. Um, but the idea that that was the way to change the world and to, you know, sort of pat yourself on the back as both a do-gooder and someone who was socially rewarded, um, the 21-year-olds actually can 
through their software skills, um, update products, create new companies that rather quickly uh, have mass, mass use and then have, have significant effects. But they do all of this um, without any broader understanding of the political economy in which technology happens to exist, to put it more bluntly in, 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 in terms of capital. And um, my, own, my own thought is that, you know, as I think Jeremy alluded to earlier, uh, if you think that the background to, the, to the, the dilemmas or the problems we point to in the book is ultimately something about um, understanding the political economy and attacking the core of the problem there, we have to fundamentally reorganize capitalism or the market as it works. Um, well, you wouldn't start then with the mindset of the technologist or the teaching of the classes that we're doing. You'd have to start in a much different place. And um, I, I'll say I'm not opposed to taking that as the problem, but the, the bet of this book, the bet of our teaching together is that the distinctive perspectives of, a, of, an, of an ethicist, ethicist, a social scientist, and a technologist um, will at least illuminate certain aspects of the important role that technologists play within this broader political economy. And, you know, for example, what I would like to be able to say in the book or to the students that I, I meet here on campus is, here is something that you can do in your professional um, role as a technologist that understands the important interplay between Silicon Valley and Washington DC or indeed the EU or anywhere else without having to say it's also on you to reform the entire political economy. Um, people may think that um, nothing in our book is opposed to people taking that as the core, the core of the problem, but it, th that effectively um, rejects the idea that people could do something in their role as a technologist as such about it. That's something for all of us to take on board as citizens or observers of the political economy. Okay, and I think this is going to have to be the final question. Uh, Terry So. Hi, um, thank you everyone. This has been um, really interesting. I have two uh, related questions. The first one you spoke about a little already, but um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your thoughts about how antitrust laws might be used to tackle some of the issues we're speaking about here today. Um, and then the second question is a bit of a follow-up to what Kobe was discussing in the chat and with his question. Um, I take your point and I agree that this is much more of a systemic issue than an individual problem. However, I'm wondering if you think that there should be mechanisms for accountability for individuals or perhaps individual companies. And if so, what might that those mechanisms look like um, and how would we go about holding these people or companies accountable? Thank you. Maybe to start on that, thanks for the question, Terry. It's a great question. Um, antitrust is one of the sabers that gets rattled a lot, especially in thinking about big companies. And honestly, at least from my point of view, I don't think it's gonna be particularly effective. Um, to address some of the real deep concerns we have. I mean, there could be economic questions that people think about, let's break these companies up into smaller companies, but in terms of the real value trade-offs, I don't think it's gonna make a deep impact. And I'll give you a simple example. If you were to break Facebook up, say, into five small Facebooks, it's not going to solve the content moderation problem, which is the bigger problem. And because of the monopolistic effect online, which you'll get in a few years, is one large Facebook and four failed companies. Um, in the history of antitrust in high tech is not a particularly successful one. You know, the DOJ brought a case against IBM in the 70s. It got litigated for 25 years and dropped. Uh, there was a case brought against Microsoft, which at the time actually seemed like it would result in the breakup of the company. It basically resulted in the slap on the wrist. And ultimately, the main thing that came out of antitrust, I think the one thing place that has real value is that it creates a threat of action that blunts some of the more aggressive stances in the marketplace. So the fact that Microsoft in the early 2000s was blunted with its super aggressive stance in the marketplace as a result of antitrust action allowed for competitors like Google to actually be able to rise. Um, but it didn't solve any of the fundamental problems. So I think that's one of the things I think it, it can be used to prevent some really egregious behavior. It's not going to solve all problems. 
unless it's really uh, intelligently coupled with other activity. Like you could break up Facebook and then say we're forcing interoperability among platforms. And so you bring together a policy solution and a technical solution to actually create a more competitive marketplace. That has some potential impacts that could, that could take hold in the long term, but it still won't solve the real problems we care about. Maybe to add one thing on your second question, I just encourage all of us to think about accountability in broad ways. So there's a very narrow way of thinking about accountability, which is like legal accountability for harms, legal liability. And that's some of the discussion, of course, that's happening around Communications Decency Act, Section 230. If only these platforms were legally liable and could be held accountable in a court of law for the harms that they cause, wouldn't everything be better? And of course, if you removed the legal immunity provisions that you have for Section 230, you'd get a ton more content moderation, right? Just as a kind of risk averse strategy to the potential threat of litigation. And then those who are concerned about the potential value of these platforms as spaces for speech, enabling BLM, enabling Me Too, et cetera, this is where these value tensions really bite. So we need a broad sense of what accountability means. And when we're talking about value trade offs, it's not really about, you know, did people break a law and do they need to go to jail? It's a question of there are benefits and there are social harms. And what are the ways that we ensure that all of us collectively are engaging in mitigating the social harms or dealing with those consequences? And that means some like obvious forms of accountability, like taxation. There's a reason that Bill Gates is out there saying that we should have a robot tax, that, that a world in which people are incentivized in a direction of automation because labor is more expensive and labor is taxed is a world in which incentives are misaligned to achieve a social value that we have, which is providing people with an ability to meet their basic needs and access meaningful work. And so, yes, a broad sense of accountability, there are lots of things that we can do to enlist companies, engineers, citizens more broadly in helping us to achieve our collective social goals, but it's not a narrow perspective on legal accountability for the harms that are caused. So I think at this stage, we're going to have to wrap up, but I just would like to uh, again, remind everybody of the book, which I think is an extraordinary and important book, not just for people who are interested in technology, but if you're interested in democracy period, because uh, the consequences of technology for democracy and the ways in which it works and doesn't work is quite profound. And this, as I say, is uh, at least to me, who, as somebody who reads uh, broadly in this area, this is the best book that, that I have read that gives you a sense of what is at stake, what the uh, conflicts are between the different ways of thinking, and uh, begins to provide provide one possible way out of many of the dilemmas that we find ourselves in. So it remains for me to uh, thank the participants, to thank Rob, Marin, and Jeremy for what has been just an extraordinary conversation. This has just been wonderful. And also to thank all of you in the audience for such great spirited questions and for coming along on this conversation, which, as I say, just, I think, has been for me an extraordinarily enlightening one. Uh, so I see it in the links if you want to find out more about the uh, kinds of teaching that is happening in Stanford. There is a lot of information available out there. And also this is something that places like Hopkins and other schools which have a strong technology focus need to be paying attention to as a model for uh, education and for building out Democracy 101 for engineers as a crucial, I think, uh, way of um, sort of providing the kinds of knowledge that we need to create a better world. So thank you all so, so much for all of this. Mm -hmm.